Really quickly to kick things off, it is really my great honor to introduce uh, Mike Hadick. Mike is the deputy director at a technical directorate of the Air Force Research Lab that's in upstate New York. It's called Rome Research Site. Mike is a civilian and he's part of the permanent staff at Rome, and he basically runs all of the research portfolios for space, for cyber, and for quantum. Um, Mike's, uh, Mike's got a PhD from Cornell University, and he's really one of the leaders in the government apparatus for driving investment forward in, in uh, quantum technologies. So uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Mike. Please come up from around the corner. Thank you, man. There you go. Great. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you so much for the kind introduction for Matt. It truly is an honor and a pleasure to be here today. Uh, you know, first off, Matt mentioned it. it. It's great to be here in person. Uh, obviously, we, we've all been, uh, you know, kind of in our own uh, little worlds with, with COVID and not being able to get out. So getting a chance to be out and, and actually talk to people is just great from my perspective and happy that we could all go forward with this. So what I'm going to do today is just talk a little bit about our program at AFRL and specifically in this talk I'm going to focus in in our quantum computing and networking program uh, at AFRL. Let me get the first slide up, that might help. Uh, so again, really thankful for the invite to be here. Uh, AFRL, as Matt said, fourth year as being part of this wonderful event. Uh, this year we had set it up that General Heather Pringle who's the AFRL commander, would be here and speak uh, to this audience. Unfortunately, due to uh, schedule constraints and overlapping commitments, she was not able to be here today. She sends her best. Uh, she hopes very much to be out here next year. In fact, she pinned me down. She called me last uh, Thursday, I believe, and said, Mike, give me the dates. I want to be there next year. I want to give the talk. So I don't know if it was a shot at me that I wasn't going to do a good job today or she just wanted to be here next year. But in any event, uh, you'll be fortunate enough to have her next year. So. Again, uh, it's great being here um, and as part of this event. So on the next slide, I'm going to talk a little bit just to ground everyone in what AFRL is. So Air Force Research Laboratory is the S&T arm of the United States Air Force, as well as now we can say the United States Space Force. Uh, shown here are technology directorates, but if you really break it down, our mission is to lead, discover, develop, and deliver science and technology and innovation for the warfighter. So, all the way from basic foundational research all the way on out to delivering it to the warfighter is what we do across AFRO. You see our mission space here, our mission technical directorates. There's nine of them spread across the United States. We're headquartered at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. I mentioned General Pringle. She uh, oversees this whole uh, complex, the enterprise. Nine technology directorates. I won't spend time going through each of them. Um, th the names kind of tell you what they are. So for example, there's four uh, directorates at Wright-Patterson. Uh, there's also directorates, two tech directorates at Kirtland Air Force Base, Space Vehicles Directed Energy, Munitions Directorate uh, is out at Eglin Air Force Base, Information Director, which I'll talk a little bit more about, is in Rome, New York. And of course, uh, you know, we couldn't do our mission without the Air Force Office of Scientific Research uh, in Arlington, Virginia. Just as important though, especially to this audience, would be our international sites. So we have three international sites currently, London, Tokyo, Santiago, Chile. That's actually expanding this year. We have great news there. Uh, we're putting a site in Australia as well as a site in Brazil. So stay tuned on that. And I think certainly with the quantum mission and quantum around the world, you know, partnering with like-minded, like-valued countries really serves a purpose of accelerating technology. And I'll talk about that too as we go through some of our partnerships. A little bit more about AFRL. So we talked about how it's headquartered at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. We have a workforce of about 11,000 employees, which includes military, government, civilians, and contractor employees. We execute a budget of over $6 billion um, per year. We have nine geographic locations. So in addition to nine technology directors, we're actually spread across nine different states within the US. Uh, our history goes way back to the uh, Army Air Forces, uh, well over 100 years now of research. Uh, and it's pretty neat now to see not only from you know, moving from Army Air Forces to the Air Force to the Space Force now as well. Just quickly on our personnel, you know, a lot of folks often wonder, you know, are you part of the Air Force? Are you uh, a blue suitor? Are you a military person? Well, no, uh, we are 
In fact, you know, myself, Matt mentioned it, uh, I am a civilian who works for the Air Force. Uh, but we do have military, of course, we have 1,200 stationed throughout the, the Air Force, and we have many um, contractor employees as well who, who really are part of our team to help us get our mission done. Uh, let's see, so, you know, lots of uh, highly educated people, about 70% of our workforce has a master's degree, uh, with, you know, much more holding a PhD as well. So, um, you know, we continue to grow that area. I think, um, you know, especially as we tackle the hard problems, continuing to develop our workforce is, is going to be critical to us. Getting right down to it, you know, why is the Air Force interested in quantum information science? We see many applications out there, some near term, some longer term that are going to take time to, to further get there. And of course, we're here for computing, so obviously that's going to probably take a little longer to get there. But let me take some time here, a few minutes, to just kind of step through all the technologies that we're working on at AFRL and to, to really give you a flavor of what we're doing. So I may not have mentioned it, but out of those nine technology directorates, six of the technology, that, uh, six TDs, technology directorates are actually performing quantum information science. Uh, and and I'll, I'll point them out as I go through my talk here. But um, first off, let's talk about timing. And really here, I mean clocks. And what we'll take, if you go to the, your upper left-hand corner here and go through the, the colors here, we'll start out with the purple with timing. Uh, and this really is some method to this madness here with the color codes, but timing, our near-term technologies, think clocks, whoops. Yes, I need to go back, there we go, thank you. Uh, think clocks there, think about stability. Right now we have about nanosecond type of stability. Uh, GPS takes several updates per day. Uh, where we're looking to go with it is uh, longer uh, duration type clocks. Uh, by that I mean uh, higher precision, higher stability, uh, moving past nanoseconds. Uh, we have many applications in mind that we need uh, that precision to be able to do. Of course, it'll take time to get there. You know, the, the more precision you have, you can think of four by eight, six, uh, four by eight optical tables. You know, how you can shrink that down will take some time to get there. But clocks, certainly here, near term, uh, in the one to five year time range in terms of being able to actually use them. Closely tied to that is sensors. So sensing, by that we mean, you know, kind of cold atom sensors would be one of those technologies. Gravimeters, gradiometers, magnetometers, uh, fiber, fiber optic gyros. All those things really play into you know, improved resolution as well as new capabilities. We tie those together with clocks, and what we're really enabling are technologies, uh, how to uh, navigate and precisely know where you are in time in a GPS-denied or degraded environment. So in fact, our uh, brethren at the Space Vehicles Directorate uh, down in um, um, Albuquerque at Kirtland Air Force Base are working those technologies as well as our sensors directorate at Wright-Patterson. Uh, in fact, really wanted to highlight this, is upcoming 2022, we're finally here after about three years of planning, we're actually gonna have a demonstration, a field demonstration out in the Pacific Rim, it's called RIMPAC. It'll happen uh, this summer, and it's be, be with our Five Eyes partners, which would be in addition to the US, UK, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. All those countries are bringing different technologies into the mix. We're actually moving the technology from the lab out to the field. Of course, not quite sure how it's gonna go, but you know, tied in with, I can't forget to mention, our, our service partners really led by the Navy, this whole experiment, as well as the Army, bringing it all together uh, on a ship, in shipping containers, and really being able to come up with you know, long duration, unaided inertial navigation, at least as the first cut. We expect you know, to, to learn a lot from that, but then two years, we're gonna go back and further refine it. Moving on to other technologies of interest. Now, if we go around the chart, communications and network, I'm gonna spend a lot of time on that uh, in the remaining charts here today. But here, you know, very closely tied to the hardware that was being developed for quantum computing. Application areas that we see for that are, of course, secure communications, low probability of intercept communications, uh, secure encryption. Certainly, what we're looking for is entanglement distribution and the properties that you get from that. Folks often think QKD there. That's not what we're interested in, frankly. The Air Force, the DOD, does not do QKD uh, for various reasons. But we're really looking at you know, how you can leverage and take advantage of new properties of uh, uh, entanglement distribution. Uh, we can also see clocks being tied together with these networks. We can see distributed computing uh, as being a necessity. So how you tie those computers together, you will need networking for that. Last but not least is computing. Uh, obviously, the focus of this conference. 
Uh, here, of course, you know how we can turn uh, data, sensor data, into actionable information. And I'll go into a little bit more application space on that. In terms of timing, of course, I mentioned clocks, near term sensing, near term as well. We talked about the field experiment, but certainly within five years, we expect some you know capabilities that could be deployed. Uh, Computing and in this area, we're hoping less than 10 years we'll have useful applications, hopefully within five years or so, maybe even sooner, you know, if things continue to move well. Uh, and certainly error corrected quantum computing will be a, a longer term bet, as will quantum networking. So uh, we're really in this for the long haul though, but we see kind of these spiral capabilities which feed one another. And on this chart here, I really talk about how those kind of feed together. So this very simple um, puzzle chart here really does hit the point home from my perspective. Of course, timing, sensing, networking, computing, all come into play, you know, we just talked about those, but the middle piece really what drives us, supply chain development, enabling technology, uh, working with the materials and manufacturing director in AFL in particular, wanted to give them a shout out, you know, how they can develop the devices that are needed to, to feed those technologies as well as the components. And then right along those lines, workforce development, uh, finding the workforce of not only today, but tomorrow. In fact, you know, I talked about the high degree of PhDs across AFRL. Not everyone's going to need to be a PhD to work this field. You know, in fact, we, we're, we're putting a lot of uh, energy into, you know, what does the workforce of tomorrow look like? You know, how can you bring in other fields, make them quantum engineers? Uh, you know, send folks who are quantum, uh, who are computer scientists, computer engineers, electrical engineers, how can they look at problems from their perspective and then map them to uh, a, a quantum computer? So really all that comes together. I also want to mention briefly our involvement in QEDC. I know a lot of folks were at the uh, plenary sessions yesterday. Great, uh, all the work that Dr. Celia Mertzbacher and previously Joe Burroughs were doing, tied in of course with NIST and Carl Williams' leadership there. But it's really allowed us as being part of that as well as to really help to see where the supply chain is going as well as to drive some of the requirements there as well. Turning our attention now to what we do in Rome, uh, in the information directorate. So I talked about those nine technology directorates. Now we're gonna narrow down and what we specifically do in Rome. So you think about Rome, uh, what we are, are information technologies, but not really the IT type world where you know you go and fix a computer. It's bigger than that. It's C4I and cyber. So by that we mean command control, communications, computing. I stands for intelligence and cyber. We always call it cyber because in Rome, you know, we were one of the pioneers and really recognizing the need for cyber technologies, the need for information warfare as it's evolving into now, but really uh, driving that area. Uh, you can read our mission there, high impact game changing technologies that enable the Air Force to maintain its superior technical advantage. But what feeds that? Technologies like quantum. Uh, other technologies, artificial intelligence, machine learning, we already mentioned cyber technologies, UAS technologies, advanced computing, uh, specific there, nanoelectronics, neuromorphic computing, looking at new paradigms where we can actually combine technologies and bring things like artificial intelligence to the edge. So really pushing forward and really, as I like to say, kind of inventing the uh, uh, future Air Force as well as Space Force now. Now we'll talk uh, about our computing piece of uh, the game. I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on this. In fact, I think I just have a couple slides on uh, computing here. Uh, the reason being, Matt mentioned it, Thursday, I invite everyone, 9.15, Dr. Dan Koch will be speaking on uh, giving a keynote on quantum algorithm development at AFRL, so I encourage everyone to be there. Dan does an amazing job with his talks in terms of going into technical depth. But why are we interested in quantum algorithms and, and what's our role in quantum computing? We often get asked that, you know, why, why, why would the Air Force be interested in quantum computing? So there's many application areas, but first off, just kind of level set everyone. You know, we're not developing the hardware that's out there uh, in using that hardware. There's a lot of great, which, which we're all seeing here usually when I talk about this, you have to lay out the companies, but I think we all, all familiar with the companies that are out there working quantum uh, computers and, and NIST developments right now. In fact, we're partnering with several of them. I'll talk about on the next slide, our specific partnership with IBM. But what we're really looking to do, as the motivation says up there, is really create that workforce for the Air Force, for the DOD, develop that community, you know, rising tide raises all ships, to really solve Air Force relevant, mission critical type problems. What do we mean by those problems? Well, we're looking at obviously things like optimization. How can you bring different domains together uh, in an efficient manner? How can you move logistics, supplies, people, uh, uh, 
uh, technologies that are needed, targeting technologies, how can you efficiently get the results you mean? And all, all that comes into what we call joint all domain command and control. And really not only uh, those technologies, but the different domains. And by domains in this, this set of context, I really do mean um, air, space, uh, cyber, uh, sea, land, and it's the jointness of it all, bringing it all together. So we see quantum as having a major play in that in the future. Uh, quantum simulations, of course, what better to uh, be able to look at uh, real type molecules, complex molecules and complex material systems of interest than to use you know, what nature has given us with quantum simulation. And the third area would be um, quantum enhanced machine learning. Uh, we see that as a little further down the line, but significantly important to us as well. So that's why we're putting, putting uh, you know, a, a lot of energy into that. Uh, three papers are highlighted there. What they really does show is in terms of understanding the devices. That's, that's really where we're at right now. How we can look at specific programming to manipulate quantum bits on specific hardware, on the current hardware. Talked about you know, our partnership with IBM that I'll go into on the next page. But also, you know, how we can map specific problems to that hardware and how we can, uh, uh, again, build out the, the problem spaces that are of interest and continue to build the knowledge base out there. So it does take a community to do that. Uh, we're very proud to partner you know, with our DOD partners as well as other partners. And in fact, I'll hit upon that here. We are partnered with IBM. We started this partnership um, back in about 2000, and actually in 2019, a three-year partnership. Uh, with IBM, uh, really giving us cloud-based access to their latest hardware. It, and it's been just a real win for us. You know, we weren't quite sure how it would work out when we started. But what it's done is not only allowed our researchers at AFRL access to the machines, it's allowed our partners to be there. So for, for instance, right now we have 13 partnerships uh, with institutions that are out there. And specifically, that would mean other government agencies, other DOD agencies, such as the Navy, we have a very big partnership with the Navy, uh, not only Naval Research Labs, but other arms of the Navy as well. Uh, we have national labs on, on the machine with us, partnering with us. We have academia, we have industry, and we have small businesses. We're looking to grow those partners. Uh, I think when this is first talked about a few years ago, you may have heard us saying, yeah, we want to really get a lot of users on. Yes, we do, but we really need it focused now. Now that we've gotten kind of where we're comfortable with. We really want to uh, focus ourselves on problems, specific Air Force problems of interest. And it goes back to kind of those three main areas that I talked about previously. So we have a booth here. I forgot to mention that early on. Uh, right as you walk in the exhibit hall, uh, Dan Koch and I will be manning it throughout the week. If you want to talk to me further about you know, some of these unique interest areas, please feel free. Let's turn our talk now to uh, networking. So this is the other main area that I'm gonna talk about in a really focus area in Rome. So here's our technologies of interest kind of broken down into to three areas here. We'll start on the left here with our Innovare Advancement Center. This is our version of an open campus. Uh, there's more to this on the next few slides. I'll, I'll go into greater detail on Innovare, but it's really been a game changer for us. And I hate to overuse that phrase of game changer, but in terms of facilities, this has been a game changer for us. So anyway, at the Innovare Advancement Center, which is our open campus where we're really working on foundational technologies partnered with other institutions uh, and other, and in some instances, non-traditional partners, looking at three modalities there, which really I'll go into detail later on uh, in my talk, but we have superconductors, quantum integrated circuits, and trapped ions. Uh, and what we see there is that we're continuing to develop the technology there. Ideally, we'll have this test bed set up where down the road, you know, when I talked about kind of that large operational view of the different technologies that were being developed, how they can bring, how users could bring those technologies, put them into the network, integrate it into the network, and see how things perform. So obviously that's a little ways out, but in terms of our vision of where we want to be creating this network test bed is certainly, you know, what Rome is all about. And I think Innovara is the perfect uh, seed for that. We then, as the technology develops, as it becomes closer to being operationalized and matures, we bring it into our in-house laboratories, if you will, inside our security perimeter. Doesn't mean we're not publishing on it, doesn't mean it's completely locked down, but we do have tighter control and tighter controls on who we're able to partner with at that point. Uh, speaking of labs, we have new labs that are just opening there, some really state-of-the-art uh, quantum laboratories. Um, on the order of about, um, I think, 3,000 square feet or so, 
uh, total. So very large laboratories, a couple laboratories there. Uh, State-of-the-art environmental control, all that is needed, obviously, in working with uh, these technologies. And then finally, really unique to us is how we can take these technologies out into the field at our three, uh, at our test sites. And specifically here, um, you know, having in mind, we do have a couple test sites, but here we're kind of focused in on uh, our Stockbridge test site where we have UAS uh, type capabilities there, either hex rotors, quad rotors, fixed wing. But what we really envision is how we can then move network technologies, move it from the lab out to the field. And for us, that means, all right, how do we really go from ground to air type of platforms? We're partnered with uh, our, our um, collaborators and our colleagues in the directed energy directorate in Albuquerque who really worry about the space layer and really worry about ground to space. So we're really kind of filling that middle area, if you will. So you know, our goals there, continue to push on the integrated photonics, be able to put that in platforms, can we shrink down ion traps and get the control we need out of that and be able to put them out in the field as well. So you can see all those technologies coming together in a really unique capability. Innovare, so what this really means, I think folks might have heard me talk about this before, but here it is, it stood up, we, you know, um, an actual picture of the building. Uh, this was uh, a, a, an old dilapidated building uh, a few years ago uh, that was you know, really looking for a good use. Oneida County stepped in, the county that we sit in, uh, along with New York State, the city of Rome, some of our other partners, and, and developed this facility for us. But specifically, I have to thank Oneida County. They put in $15 million of their funding, of state funding, to really renovate this facility and to make it a, a real showcase of 40,000 square feet of three four floors within it. Wouldn't be possible without uh, you know, our other partners there uh, as well, being uh, SUNY, being NICE Tech, and being the Griffiths Institute. A um, little bit more about it. Let's see, so we have multiple fridges, trapped ions, photonic setups within it. Uh, there's a great website if you want to look at it, innovare.org. Uh, two, two 15,000 square foot laboratories that are uh, being showcased there right now. In fact, if you go, you can look. Uh, Colonel Tim Lawrence, who was our former director in Rome, we just named one of the laboratories for him uh, at the end of October. So really happy with how things are coming there. Our strategy for, for the lab and uh, Innovare in particular, that's, I think that's one of the things that sets us apart from other models that are out there is you know, the strategy we have and the metrics that we have. And you can read the strategy up there. Uh, in the interest of time, I, I, I won't go through it, all the words, but really hits upon those foundational technologies. So not only the quantum technologies that we're developing and, and so interested in here, but other deep technologies, AI, machine learning, cyber, UAS technologies, um, our advanced computing technologies, which I mentioned earlier, neuromorphic computing, all being seated there. Uh, I talked about our founding partners, but we have many other partners as well right now that are signed up and working with us there. I've already talked about a few, such as the Navy uh, Naval Research Laboratory. I go into detail on some of these others. IBM, we've talked about, of course, um, different parts of the Air Force, specifically the Air Force Academy, Air Force Institute of Technology. Uh, Syracuse University, which is right next door to us, we see ourselves as really having a nice synergistic relationship with Syracuse, especially as they are making a, a, a very deep investment in quantum uh, currently ongoing. Next slide. Uh, now I'm gonna go, as, as I kinda go through the last five minutes here or so, is really look at the specific technologies that feed our network and talk about some of our recent results. So first off, how does everything fit together here? So our heterogeneous qubit integration. Uh, this is bringing those three technologies together and it's, it's difficult to bring them all together but we really are trying to make the best of all worlds here because each of those technologies have their own strengths to them. So for instance, trapped ions, you think of long lived memories that are critical in any sort of network. Uh, superconductors, fast information processing, the fact that um, you, know, you can leverage uh, state-of-the-art commercial fabrication uh, technologies to fabricate uh, superconductors, that's key there. And finally, integrated photonics. Wow, what a boom that's seen the last few years. But really there, you know, you, you can't transport the information in a network easily unless you're doing it with light, with, it, with photonics. So it's really bringing those technologies together. How do we do that? You can see some of the, the interests there in terms of our transduction, 
you know, wide band gap photonics to be able to integrate with trapped ions with qubits, um, as well as superconducting metamaterials for efficient mode operation. You know, those, those are the types of things I think we see as really key into to making this type of network really practical. Digging into trapped ions a little bit here. So certainly we talked about the memory that uh, trapped ions bring you. Uh, we're exploring uh, two species there. So we heard maybe in the past few years now, uh, uh, Euterbium 171, that we were the first DOD lab to trap ions for. We've continued to, to build on that. But really the last year or so, two years I guess now, would be barium, something that we're very interested in uh, uh, working on. And why barium, you might ask? Well, it's really the compatibility with photonics and the wavelengths and the conversion that uh, is, is necessity there. So for example, your terbium, uh, it emits in the UV. How to efficiently upconvert that in transport and photonics is difficult uh, at best. So if we look at barium, much closer to visible wavelength, which allows then more efficient and easier conversion to then be uh, uh, transported. So you'll see this is kind of breaking news here, uh, the barium trap right there. So what we've actually done, uh, the team has done, led by uh, Dr. David Huckle, is the last few weeks, they've actually trapped a series of seven barium ions. And more to come on that, but again, first time a DOD lab has done that. So we, we see ourselves continuing to build on that, and in fact, hoping to partner with other trapped ion experts out there as well on that. And then finally, what does barium allow us? It, um, you'll see kind of the cartoon diagram up there. So I talked about the efficiency of being able to transport things, but even more so being able to separate the different wavelengths that are there because of the separation, your excitation, as well as your detection wavelengths are different, so they can be spatially separated uh, within a fiber and allows for a single fiber probing. So uh, much more to come on that, I think, as we move forward. Superconducting qubits, I have a couple slides on these. So obviously we talked about the fast information processing with qubits uh, that, that it brings to us. So certainly how, how are uh, qubits formed in superconductors? We're gonna hear a lot of great application talks on that, but just simply put, certainly at the macroscopic level, you're able to, to lay down superconducting films. You cool them down at cryogenic temperatures. Uh, what that then forms are electron pairs, which can be manipulated, really developed into quantum states with atoms having discrete energy levels, which then of course can be manipulated in terms of entanglement or superposition. Cool part there, of course, are the states uh, that it gives you, uh, the, the fabrication technologies, being able to bring in uh, semiconductor processing techniques into it to go large scale. Uh, obviously, uh, one of the leaders in the field right now, so being able to be part of that as you know, used in our network for information processing, I think is gonna be very clear for us, uh, a need for us going forward. Some recent data on this. Uh, I really have to credit our next speaker, Professor uh, Will Oliver, uh, uh, from MIT Lincoln Labs. And really, Dr. Oliver, thank him and his group for what they've done in terms of our collaboration and our partnerships. Uh, they've fabricated uh, these um, superconductor devices for us as we've built up our laboratories. We then went and tested them, and you can see the results here in terms of coherence times and uh, gate fidelities. Um, state of the art right there, so we knew our systems are up and running, we're able to uh, then take those results, we'll work on further refining the technologies and really building upon it as well. Last slide that I wanted to talk about here would be our integrated photonics efforts. This is really led by Dr. Uh, Mike Fanto and really thank AIM Photonics, the American Institute for Manufacturing of Integrated Photonics and the work they have done there uh, we've been very proud to be a leading partner of that, one of the sponsors of AIM Photonics from the Air Force perspective. You'll see in the lower left-hand side, 300 millimeter quantum wafer. Lots of different functionalities on there, uh, in, including you know, th things such as quantum processors, uh, Moxender arrays, uh, entangled photon sources. So in fact, there's a blow up in the upper right-hand side of entangled uh, photon sources using four-wave mixing that's found on the wafer. Below that would be, as put in a package, arrays of Mach Zender modulators used for information processing in a network and our partners with uh, Rochester Institute of Technology. And finally, in the middle there, in the pinkish slide, would be that conversion piece, right? How you link ion traps 
with uh, uh, being able to transmit them using photonics, so silicon nitride based uh, devices there as well. So all those technologies, we continue to push on uh, you know, our partners at AIM and New York Creates. I know they have talks later in the week and they have a booth as well, but it's been, a, again, a unique partnership. And if you're getting one thing out of me here today, it's certainly all about the partnerships uh, for us at the lab. So with that, I have about a minute to go here. Again, you know, today I focused in on our quantum computing and quantum networking efforts at AFRL. I uh, talked about our you know, Innovare Advancement Center and how that all feeds into what we see as a real key piece for us in terms of that network test bed. Um, another thing you know, certainly would be our partnerships. Uh, we continue to grow those partnerships. We, we have uh, slides uh, that we often show with the different pieces and different components. So please, I'm at the booth. If you have any interest, uh, and working with us, want to learn a little bit more about it, please feel free to see me. I'm here all week. So thank you very much.